I'd like to uh, introduce our, our lecturer, uh, Dr. Uh, Carlin Cullen. Uh, Dr. Cullen is an associate professor in the marketing uh, school here in the, in the business faculty, and also a uh, fellow in the Core Climate Knowledge and Viticulture Institute. Much of, uh, of Carmen's teaching and research over recent years has focused on the business end of wine. He's been uh, pivotal in a number of uh, initiatives and collaborations uh, involving his wine expertise and cubby and uh, international organisations. And one comes to mind, that's our relationship with the uh, University of Burgundy. Carmen's uh, fostered uh, a number of collaborations with them, one of which has resulted in the very successful uh, Barkas future uh, conference uh, series. Carmen's won numerous uh, teaching awards um, uh, over the last uh, uh, five or six years um, and recently his research is focusing on generational cohorts and how they uh, may differ in their perception of wine and in their wine behaviour. And so his talk to us today is on Generation Y uh, and their uh, behaviour um, towards sparkling wine. So with that note, please join me in welcoming Dr. Carmen Cullen. Thanks, Gary, and thank you all for coming out, and uh, welcome to everybody watching on the internet. Uh, as you can appreciate, having people watch on the internet is a little bit frightening to somebody of my generation. Uh, the younger folks here wouldn't bother them at all. Quick show of hands, this is the audience participation part of the show. How many people here are on MySpace or Facebook? Okay, have a look around. When I ask that question in my classes, typically 20 to 22 year old undergraduates, it isn't some of the hands, it isn't most of the hands, it's all of the hands. Everybody is Facebook, MySpace. And it's this kind of connectedness that really serves to differentiate in great part a generation Y from old fogies like me. No, I'm not on MySpace or Facebook either. My son is. Business school, we use a lot of cases, uh, educate through cases. Several of my students actually are here, and I'm very, very happy to see that. Uh, we're approaching an anniversary, almost exactly four years ago. Uh, Burger King launched a new sandwich, it was their crispy sandwich. And the message they wanted to get across was, have it your way, okay? have it your way. You can have the crispy sandwich your way. Anybody here, raise your hand, ever hear of subservient chicken. <laughs> There's subservient chicken. Uh, interesting marketing because if you think of the point that they're trying to make uh, with Burger King, have it your way, you can uh, come up with a big advertising campaign that you used to have in the past, develop a jingle, and get people convinced that you should come to Burger King for your chicken sandwich. Where are you? There you are. Here's subservient chicken asleep on the couch. Yeah. What would you like the subservient chicken to do? Come back, my screen went dead. There we go. This is one of the problems of technology. You wonder why I get frustrated with this? My screen's dead, you're seeing it up there. Uh, run around. It gets more creative. You can ask it to lay an egg. It will. <laughs> you can ask it to show, show his bum. 
and he'll come in front of the camera and wag his finger. So, what is the magic in this? In the four years that this has been up and available, they've had over a billion hits. The first day that it was up, the first day, one million hits. The first week, 20 million hits. Think about the power of this. This is classic viral marketing we're talking about, viral marketing. One of the options on the screen that you probably saw was pass it to my friends, pass it on to any of your friends. They uh, have been very successful with this. We're going to look at that generation and the importance of viral marketing and why and how Gen Y buys things. Uh, my research is consumer behavior, retail. Those are typically the areas that I've spent time in. Trying to understand why people buy things and why they go to a certain store, and why they don't buy things and why they don't go to a certain store. So why sparkling wine? Well, first of all, I love sparkling wine. Yeah, I like it. I think it's underappreciated, underconsumed, and I think there's great potential. I'm going to just throw some quick stats at you that were compiled by the Wine Council of Ontario, VQA, for me. But why sparkling wine? Because it's 3.11% of the Canadian wine market by volume. All of my slides will be available uh, from Mike. Mike, you'll make sure that my slides are available, right? So 2007. It's 4.4% of the Canadian wine market at retail. <coughs> So, it's a non-trivial amount. And sparkling wine in Ontario is roughly around the same size. But if you look at sales increases, total sales increases in Canada, and then for sparkling wine, but the neat part is the increase in sparkling wine value in Canada. Well, how about Ontario? For Ontario, Total wine and sparkling wine. The critical point to me is down here, the increase in sparkling wine value and where we're going. So why sparkling wine? The data raised some interesting issues. It represents a non-trivial amount of money, roughly a quarter of a billion dollars in annual sales in Canada. The volume of sales of sparkling wine is increasing but a slower rate than volume of wine sales in general, both in Canada and in Ontario. But the value of sales from sparkling wine is increasing at a more rapid weight rate than wine sales in general, both for Canada and Ontario. So the trends are in the right direction. It's a great product. But why sparkling wine? I'm going to spend the first few minutes. Please, come on in. Don't worry. My students lose all their participation grades for that. But in this case, I'm delighted to have you here. Why sparkling wine? Interesting quote. Bepi Crisario, March 12th this year in the Globe and Mail. Most wine aficionados know it takes brisk weather to get high natural acidity out of sparkling wine's best grape varieties, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. And the whole world knows frigid weather is our most abundant natural resource. In marketing parlance, it's called playing to your strengths. This is something that we do well. I've had some wonderful sparkling here. Why sparkling? I go and get the best possible sources for information and quotes that I can. Uh, find the experts. To me, it's been obvious for a long time that the climate, the terroir, the naturally high acids, we have everything for what should be a premium sparkling wine producing region. I agree totally with Gary on this. I had my research assistant go through all of the websites uh, for the members of the Wine Council of Ontario. And they only listed 14, there were only 14 wineries of the 76 that listed sparkling on their list of wines. And I know for a fact there are more than that. 
and there are some that are planning uh, to launch fairly soon. Are you guys selling at Flat Rock yet? No? Not yet. Not yet, okay. So, I mean, there are more and more heading, heading that way. Finally, I promise. Okay. Why sparkling? In a San Francisco Chronicle feature last November, titled The Bubbly Issue, a field guide to sparklers from around the world, the tiny English industry figured prominently, beside Italy, Austria, and even, believe it or not, Russia. Canada, it wasn't even mentioned. That was Bepi Crisario again, Globe and Mail, that March 12th article. So, why sparkling? First of all, it's a great product. There's money to be made. We can do it really well. And apparently people don't know that we do. Why Generation Y? And I will try to scotch tape the two together. Anybody that's ever read Boom, Bust, and Echo remembers that Dave Foote suggests that you can explain two-thirds of anything with demographics. And one of the reasons that we want to study Generation Y is that there's so many of them. Uh, just like the baby boomers, there were lots of us. These folks are loosely the children of the boomers, born between 76 and 2000, approximately a quarter of the population. They've got significant buying power, and they also influence a lot of household purchases. So they're, they're an important group. They're important to our, our economy and where everybody is heading. Our focus in our research is leading edge of Generation Y, those between 19 and 30, and trying to figure out why they buy sparkling wine, why they don't buy sparkling wine, why they buy wine, why they don't buy wine. That's the focus of my research, and it has been for a long time. And trying to figure out the drivers of both. There is uh, Scott's Hospitality uh, decided they were going to open up a pizza restaurant. They did incredible marketing research. And they found, you know what people hate about pizzerias? When they're not clean. And that was so offensive to most people. Scott's decided when they were opening up their pizza stores, they were going to make them the cleanest possible pizza stores they could. And what happened? Nothing. Okay? They didn't go that route. Because you don't go to pizzerias because they're clean. You go there for the ambience, for the great food, for whatever. But it isn't because it's clean. So there's two different things working here. There's things that will make us go to a store, and there are other things that may not be just the reverse, but on a whole different scale, that will keep us away. Same thing for wine. So we're looking at this and trying to understand the young. We're trying to understand Generation Y. There's a lot of folks, great potential. This is where the future of the industry is heading. And I found this quote that I thought was great. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. And that quote is actually Plato quoting Socrates, trying to prove that there's nothing new under the sun and that young generations are always young generations. And it's the same with us. There's nothing new about our interest in it. There's a lot of reasons for studying that. So these folks are also known as Gen Y, the Echo Generation, Millennials, the Nexters, the next big thing. Every now and then when you see me hammering away over here, it's that this has attention deficit disorder, and you've got to bang away on it. Gen Y, R. Now, each of these bullet points is sort of the main conclusion of peer-reviewed academic research. And you're going to find some interesting points here. Uh, Generation Y are heavily influenced by peer pressure. They're savvy, and they're cynical. Their antenna are always out. They're always looking for hypocrisy, and they're testing things. Right now, the young folks around here that are under 30, they're listening to this 
with their antenna out. They're impatient. They want us to get to the point. They're proficient with and unafraid of technology. Uh, they can, however, read clocks and show up on time. There's my illustrious colleague, Barry Wright, just arrived. Well, it's good to be here, <laughs> They are connected, and they need connections. That's how we started off, the MySpace Facebook thing. They're not tolerant of blatant ads. They hate it when people actually come out and try to sell them something. But you saw subservient chicken? They thought that was cool, it was funny, it was different. And it wasn't Burger King trying to hit them over the head and tell them to buy the chicken. So they don't like blatant advertising. They are on Facebook, MySpace, and they use that to communicate. They do text and other things. They're influenced by celebrities. Okay? They do watch what celebrities wear, consume, but they're on guard for phoniness. Generation Y's, notoriously brand disloyal. So this is the conclusion of one peer-reviewed study. The very next peer-reviewed study I read said, Generation Y are risk avoiders. So one of the things that we're finding looking through the literature is that there's a lot of contradictory conclusions. Because one of the reasons that we use brands is to avoid risk. So within the literature, it would be nice to say that this is definitively what's happening, but there's a lot of noise in the conclusions. One thing that we find all the time is they're looking for street credibility in their purchases. They want their friends and colleagues to think that they're cool with it and happening. They're jaded, as they have seen 23 million media messages by the age of 21. So they've seen it all. They've seen all the blatant ads. But if you can come up with humor, creativity, interaction, something that's novel. Uh, do you know the Blend Tech Blender? Anybody here ever see the Blend Tech Blender? What's the catchphrase with this thing? And what, do you know how it's marketed? Have you seen that? Yeah, I just see the blended uh, iPhone. Yeah. IPhone. Will it blend, okay? So they, they want to demonstrate, blend tech, that this thing will blend anything. So they put in garden rakes and blend it. Uh, the iPhone, will it blend? To uh, me, really childish. To my 26-year-old son, absolutely freaking hilarious. You know? And so the one brand of blender that he will know is blend tech. Blend tech, subservient chicken, all of these things have become part of the pop culture lexicon. Much like, where's the beef? Okay? People in my generation, and a bit younger, you say, where's the beef? They know exactly everything about it. Clara Peller, uh, marketing Wendy's hamburgers. It was our pop culture lexicon. How do we market to Generation Y? Well, let's go to the experts and see how we market to Gen Y. Gardick and Lapsley, 2007, come from Texas A&M, and that's the home of the best retail research in the planet. If you want to find retail research, go to Texas A&M. Gardick and Lapsley talking about marketing to Gen Y. Gen Y used different purchase criteria than earlier generations, me. Overall, Gen Y is more connected with more concerned with how the product makes them appear and with keeping up with trends than our older shoppers who more greatly appreciate the shopping experience. So it's coming back to this thing about I want to look good with my peers, want to have the, the new product. Moritz Research, finding similar things. More than any other generation, they're influenced by keeping up with what my friends have, having the newest product of its kind. And because they're in constant communication, the influence of peers is more important than traditional brand advertising. So it's a slightly different animal we're marketing to. Euromonitor uh, summarizes research from all around the world. And we have finally got uh, Linda Lowry managed. There she is, our, our business librarian, spectacular. And she managed to fight through the bureaucracy and red tape and get us Euromonitor. Euromonitor summarized all the research that's been done on Gen Y. And their conclusion, 
Jan Y, our technology, technology adopters, online community dwellers, peer-to-peer, -peer, egocentric, hedonistic spenders, fashion influencers, media mistrusters, spin detectors, civic-minded, socially conscious, mass advertising, it's, I can't finish that. But you get the idea, and it's all there. They've summarized this in a lot of detail. Now, to why you're here, finally, after 25 minutes. Generation Y and wine. What do we know about Gen Y and wine? Surprisingly, not a lot in academic research, but if you want to find the best academic research for this, you go to Sonoma State, California, and you knock on the door of Liz Tosh, Janine Olson, Linda Nowak, Novak, and their study in 2006, many other conclusions, but Gen Y consumers drink wine for social occasions, not to get drunk. So their use of wine is not what you would expect young folks to use alcohol for. It's a social event. It's a beverage to consume on special social occasions with friends and family. That is how they perceive wine. Now, the clever among you will realize that this was done in Sonoma State. Sonoma is a wine-making region, so it's conceivable that the sample population is a little bit biased here, much the same as when we do wine-related research here in the Niagara. Reasons for Gen Y not drinking wine. Remember I said the things that people like about a product and the things that they dislike about a product, it's important to understand both. So, Reasons for them not drinking wine. What do you think the number one reason is? Price. Price, yeah, yeah, price is one of the reasons, and we'll see that in a few minutes. But the number one reason is they don't like the taste of it. And if you look at a lot of Gen Y-related research, it has a lot more to do with cultural issues and making it cool and making it hip. But only 11% found wine to be not cool, not hip. It's something about the taste. And so one of the arguments that I'm going to be making here is that marketers have to pair up and team up with folks like Gary and who are looking at taste, the dimensions of taste. We can't just spend all of our time looking at pretty packaging and interesting viral marketing techniques. How they describe wine. The methodology here was that they were asked to pick from bunches of adjectives. So here's a bunch of adjectives and phrases and words. Pick out the ones that you think best describe wine. So for the Gen Y people, these are the words that they picked out. These are the top four. Expensive. Okay. Snobby. Snooty. I didn't even know that Gen Y New, snooty, used, snooty, or whatever. Anyway, that was number three on their list. And way too serious. Expensive, snobby, snooty, way too serious. So, in short, they find wine pretentious, and they despise pretense. If they find wine to be snobby and snooty, it's at least conceivable that they may find sparkling wine and champagne to be even more pretentious. But, on the other hand, on the other hand, 20-something adults across America are the new driving force in the wine market. When it comes to wine, they drink more, they know more, they spend more, and enjoy a broader international selection of wines, on average, than any generation before them. And that's from Patrick Merrill, who's from uh, San Mateo, California, quoted in the LA Times, March 12, 2008. Uh, with all my sources, you'd think that March 12, 2008 was the only day I read a newspaper anywhere, but it just happened that, <laughs> yeah. And still, on the other hand, because it's, to this point in time, we're getting sort of a jaded picture of these folks, and do we really want to look at them to drink wine and sparkling wine? Well, that last quote gives us a little bit more faith, and if you want a lot more faith, what do we know about I Yellow? If you want a great wine club to belong to, and if you're really interested in Gen Y, uh, these are the folks to contact. Uh, some great stories about them. Go on the internet, type in I Yellow, do some reading, join their club.
Yes, I'm back here banging away at this thing again. So, why generation Y? There's lots of them. We don't really seem to know with any certainty how they relate to wine, and sparkling wine in particular. We know that they are going to be important to the future of the industry. But beyond that, there's a great deal of contradictory information floating around. So we need to make some sense of all of this. There's a real danger in assuming homogeneity of a generational cohort. So saying, Gen Y does this. Gen Y believes this. Gen Y drinks this. Okay? That is <laughs> really broad strokes. So uh, marketers want to funnel that down, have a little bit better view of what's going on. Not bad, I've introduced it now. 30 minutes, Gary. Uh, we're into Generation Y and Sparkling Wine, which if you've got a really good memory, was actually the title of this presentation. Very little academic research on the topic. Not surprising, given that there wasn't much on wine in Generation Y. But there's some really interesting anecdotal popular press information out there that we can perhaps tap into and get some ideas about marketing. More audience participation. Who's this? Jay-Z. Hey, very good. Jay-Z. Uh, Jay-Z, known as the E.F. Hutton of hip-hop. When Jay-Z speaks, the hip-hop generation listens. He's a mogul. He's actually gotten out of performing now too much. Uh, look at the duds. Very nice. Likes to have bling and be associated with bling, all of that kind of thing. And incorporates his favorite wine into the lyrics of his songs. If you can't see that back there, that's Cristal. And if you want to know the power of Jay-Z, Agenda Inc. for 2005, Billboard's brand mentions in top 20 songs. Number one, Mercedes. Number two, Nike. Number three, Bentley. Number four, Rolls-Royce. Number eight, Cristal. So this has become part of the hip-hop generation and culture. Uh, but Frédéric Rousseau. <laughs> I'll apologize for this little shot ahead of time. But be careful when you're talking to the press, because you never know how something's going to come out. <laughs> and uh, made, made a couple of unfortunate comments, and essentially the nature of it was uh, I'm not all that excited about having my brand associated with a hip-hop generation. Okay? And Jay-Z's response was, it has come to my attention that the managing director of Cristal, Frédéric Rizzo, views the hip-hop culture as unwelcome attention. I will no longer support any of his products. So we got Jay-Z, and his videos after that point, Armand de Brignac, the gold bottle, and how badly has it hurt Cristal? Well, not a lot of the folks that were listening to the songs and could understand the lyrics were really in the price range where they were going to drop 300 to 500 bucks a bottle at a club on a bottle of bubbly. So they weren't really in the target market. But it's the association, the association with having made it, being super successful. And he's moved on. Now, let's get back to Generation Y and the party scene. Uh, you go to clubs, you go to parties, you'll find people that'll look like this. They're making loving eye contact there over a bottle of pop. Uh, anybody know who that woman is, by the way? We'll find out who's reading People magazine around here. Okay, that's Sofia Coppola. And we know her, right? But did you know this? Sophia. Anybody familiar with this? Champagne in the can. Uh, interesting box, a hexagonal presentation box. Four cans, uh, total 750 milliliters more or less. 
It was about 187 milliliters in can. What's the first thing that you thought of when you saw this? To me, I saw Christmas. Um, and I'm wondering about the pop, 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 pop. The targeting, the strategy, everything that's involved in this product. So I wanted to look at them more carefully and try to understand what were they attempting to accomplish marketing this to Generation Y. Well, it was launched in June 2004 and their target was the sophisticated female Gen Y. They were looking at high-end clubs in Miami, Las Vegas. Can is, and I swear to you, I'm not making this up, this was in their advertising copy. Upscale but not snooty. There's <laughs> They must have read the same research. Upscale but not snooty. Refined but not stodgy. <sighs> <laughs> now when, when I was younger and uh, going through university and acquiring a very poor palate, I drank copious amounts of Black Tower. Did you know that Black Tower is available in a can now? But it isn't just Black Tower. Launched February 5th, 2008. The brand name is Fizz. If you squint, you can see Fizz here, you can see Fizz there. It's sparkling wine in a can, 20 centiliters. And their launch, UK, Canada, Brazil, Korea, and Sweden. Uh, I was down at our local LCBO there, and uh, it hasn't appeared here yet. Uh, but it's on its way. Cool cash in a can. Frisant. Lower Austrian Weinviertel region. Look at the positioning. Perfect for parties, clubs, and bars. 100% recyclable, earning us some seriously green brownie points. So that is how they're attempting to position and market their spin on sparkling in a can. So where are we? There are many compelling reasons for studying the relationship that Generation Y has or doesn't have with sparkling wine. The majority of information that we're dealing with here has focused on packaging innovations, culture, not a heck of a lot on taste. So let's review quickly the strategy that Coppola used by looking at the target market specifically that they're after, the marketing mix. You can't come to a marketing lecture and not hear about the marketing mix, the four P's, product, place, price, promotion. That's our marketing strategy. Now, what did they do? They said their target isn't just Gen Y, but it's sophisticated female Gen Y. The brand name, the packaging and everything was something that they felt would appeal to the sophisticated female Gen Y. Nature of the product. Research has shown Gen Y don't particularly like the taste of wine and the taste of sparkling wine. So, they added 8% Muscat to the Pinot Blanc Sauvignon Blanc blend to make it have sweeter overtones that may sit more comfortably on the palates of the target market. To make the product more accessible. Gen Y finds wine too expensive, so rather than full bottle splits, 187 milliliter cans, so you don't have to buy an entire big bottle. Gen Y finds wine uncool, so the can with a cool sipping straw uh, that they thought was pretty impressive. So in terms of the product, price, it was launched at $20 for a four pack. Uh, clubs were selling it for six to 10 per can. Distribution, night club, clubs in Miami, Las Vegas, they also did that in San Francisco. One of the good things from a business perspective, it improves the direct product profitability. Due to it being easier to store, easier to ship, uh, lower break breakage. And promotion. Try to reposition their wine as cool. The can itself is good promotion. Being seen at clubs. The hexagonal four-pack box is great dynamite point of purchase display material. Having Sofia Coppola as a spokesperson doesn't help. Doesn't help, doesn't hurt. Getting it seen in the right place with the right people. So their promotion strategy was consistent with all of the rest of the elements. It's a great case study in launching a new product. So in summary, 
there's some basic marketing theory here that can be utilized. Identify the target market with some precision. Design a marketing mix to account for those things they like and they don't like. And then let's look a little bit more closely at liking and disliking a sparkling wine. You're going to find that uh, those of you interested in the business of wine, the marketing wine, there's some great research in Australia, uh, New Zealand, California, but tons in research. 72% of Australians do not like sparkling wine. The main reason for not liking sparkling wine in California was Tosh and Olson, was the taste. Steve Charters, who's the uh, Champagne Professor of Management at the Champagne Management School, and he's been here, talked at Bacchus a couple of times, and he's actually a co-researcher of Gary's and mine in some research in this area, found that the hedonic attributes of taste and pleasure were the main reasons given for disliking champagne. Symbolic attributes, success, celebration of champagne, were the main reasons given for liking sparkling wine. So the things that people like and the things that they don't like, different. Research questions that we we're interested in, and by we I mean Gary and me, we we're doing some research in this area. What drives the liking of sparkling wine for Gen Y? Is there a degree of taste sensitivity related to the degree of liking of sparkling wine? And we're going to talk about taste sensitivity in a minute. Is there involvement with wine related to their liking of sparkling wine? Like how important is wine to their overall life? I mean, is this something that they're really keen about, they're really into it, or not so much? The method, a convenient sample. 406 consumers of alcoholic beverages in Ontario. Three Niagara wineries, three LCBO outlets, a bunch of activities here at Brock. Two-page questionnaire. Uh, one page, the demos, how much they consume, what kinds of things they drank, measuring their level of involvement. And then a seven-point liking scale for dry wine and sweet wine. Uh, from really like it to really don't like it at all. And then a simple taste test to determine prop sensitivity. Prop? That's what prop is. Now my lovely assistant has been given 30 seconds to tell you what prop is and why we should care. Gary, stand up please, join me. Thing, but that was fine. <laughs> okay, this is a quick summary of uh, the data that were generated. And a lot of uh, Gen Y research, generational research that you've seen, is making comparisons across these dimensions. And we can do that too on a few, few things, like the involvement with wine. You'll notice that our sample 
has the largest percentage of low involvement with wine. These are people that just drink wine occasionally. It's not a big deal in their life at all. They're not really into it. Medium and high. That's one of the differences. Other obvious difference, the median age. And prop taster status. And you'll see that the prop taster status, there isn't really a heck of a lot of intergenerational, intergenerational differences. Uh, they're roughly in the same ballparks that Gary was talking about. So what we're doing here, our research right now is going down. We're trying to understand generation Y. We're essentially ignoring all the rest. We have the data to do the comparisons. That's another day, another paper, another time. What we're doing is going like this try to understand Gen Y. Bit more data on them. How often they consume wine per month. You'll note that they are significantly less than the other groups. Frequency of other alcohol consumption, roughly the same. So wine as a percent is a little bit low for this group. And then there's something down here, it's wine adventurousness. We'll make sure that copies of the paper are available for you. Just send me an email, we'll ship you out a copy. Uh, it has all of the specifics and the annoying statistics and everything like that. Some interesting findings. No gender differences in liking either dry sparkling or sweet sparkling for Generation Y. You notice the sample was split 50-50, male-female, and there were no gender-based differences. But if here dealing with dry wine, we bring in the notion of tasters. Non-taster, medium taster, super taster. The non-taster line goes in a direction differently than medium tasters and super tasters. It becomes even more dramatic when we go to sweet sparkling wine. For non-tasters, males. Males do not like, in comparison to females, if they're non-tasters, sweet sparkling wine. So see the importance of what we're attempting to look at here and Gary's great research on taste. That part of the reason for not liking sparkling wine or wine in general is the taste of it. But a lot of marketers, my my friends and colleagues, just sort of ignore that. And we assume that there's a homogeneity of taste. When common sense dictates that there has to be something else that's going on here. Uh, if you've ever read a book by Paco Underhill, if you have anything to do with retailing, make sure you get a copy of this, commit it to memory. It's why we buy The Science of Shopping. One of the little factoids that he has in it, his name is Paco Underhill, why we buy The Science of Shopping talks about young people see a very different world than I do. The world is much brighter for them. That's the way that our eyes age. And so in terms of advertising, getting their attention, etc. And so he goes on and on like that. This is sort of in the same ballpark, but it isn't a generational evolutional thing. As we saw across all the generations, there are these three groups. Fascinating stuff, and I'm so thankful that Gary allowed me to parachute onto his research. The two slides that you just saw show female non-tasters exhibit significantly higher liking for sweet sparkling, and to a lesser extent, dry sparkling, than male non-tasters. If you take the medium tasters and the non-tasters and you put them together, the combined group exhibits a significantly stronger liking of sweet sparkling wine than for the super taster group of Gen Y. These are conclusions that are in the paper as well. So super tasters, less liking of the sweet wine. Involvement, how involved people are with wine. High involvement Gen Ys like dry sparkling wine significantly more than do low involvement Gen Ys. That's a fascinating finding to me. People that are into it like dry sparkling more. Low involvement Gen Ys like sweet sparkling wine significantly more than do high involvement Gen Ys. And this probably reinforces everything that you thought to be true. That people's palates evolve over time, they start with sweet and then they evolve. The more they get into wine, the more involved they get in it, the less they're attracted to the sweet wines and want more dry. Uh, there is some research that supports this. Uh, 
Some of the best, once again, sorry, Sonoma, uh, with Liz Tosh and Tim Hanai uh, doing research in this area. So it, we found some interesting stuff. Conclusion, there are differences that are managerially relevant within the group known as Gen Y. We can do something with these differences. The next thing is we're part of a major international study of Gen Y and sparkling wine that is investigating cultural differences in Gen Y and sparkling. I said before, it's really dangerous to assume homogeneity in a generational cohort. What's to say that Gen Y in Australia is the same as Gen Y in Canada, is the same as Gen Y in South Africa? So one of the things that we're doing here is nine different universities in seven different countries are investigating cultural differences in Gen Y and sparkling. In Canada, there's only one university doing it, that's Brock. The research here is exploratory. We still don't know much about this. We want to study it. We want to find out. Focus groups, 78 participants per group, minimum of three groups each site. We're going to start off showing stimuli, then we're going to serve wine. And right now, the protocol is that we're going to be using local sparkling wine. We're going to be using some champagne and some cava, maybe prosecco. We're going to look at wines from different areas and get Gen Y's attitudes towards these, their liking, their disliking for these wines. Come back here. Thank you. Research questions. Is there a regional preference for sparkling wine? Place of origin. Uh, does that influence your perception of the sparkling wine? What do they think of sparkling wine? Do they like it? Are there differences among Gen Ys in different countries? Which is really where the research started. What images are conjured up when you mention sparkling wine? What do they think of in terms of sparkling wine? What situations are appropriate or not appropriate for them to drink sparkling wine? How do they determine what's good sparkling wine, poor sparkling wine? How does sparkling wine fit as a treat, an aperitif, with a meal, celebration? Nights out, displaying success. I suggest all of the above, but we'll see what Gen Y says. What do you associate with sparkling wine? History, heritage, tradition, all of these sorts of things. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking for questions and hopefully suggestions for this multinational study that is just about to take place. It's sparkling wine, Generation Y, around the world. Thanks for your attention. I'll take any questions you have now. Yeah. If you think Cava 
And this is such a great tradition of, of sparkling wine that they're used to drinking kava in that kind of bitter um, note, where maybe in California or here they're not. So we get in, and then the different grape varieties. So I, I'm just thinking, I would, I would think that we would want to have at least one wine that every site has so that then you can compare over place. Absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. That we're going to be using champagne and cava in all of the countries. Okay, so that's. But the same champagne and the same cava. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Because <laughs> no, that's that's what we're going to be using yeah. in each each of the countries. Well, that's good. And then, but then we get to decide which local. Yeah. In addition, and actually, it'll be a couple of champagnes <coughs> and a couple of cavas uh, that we'll be using but they will be consistent across our Yeah, thanks, I'm, I'm glad we clarified that. Yeah. Uh, yes, Paul. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Yeah, um, <clears throat> recently uh, it was announced in France that uh, they've extended the Champagne Eckridge um, grapes grown. Obviously, the French see a uh, growing market and they haven't been able to meet demand. Um, what sort of research has been done to, um, let's say, develop a strategy on how a small region like this can compete with this? Uh, that would be great uh, for my economics friends uh, to comment on intelligently. Uh, I am interested in consumer behavior and what makes people buy and what makes people not buy. My interest here, the thing that I'd be studying, would be is there a perception of lower quality of champagne coming from the new area? Uh, can people detect a difference in it? Or is the difference just strictly perception based on where the grapes are coming from. The other question is excellent, but that's just not something that I do. You want to? Uh, oh. yeah, I wanted to uh, follow up on the point that Linda brought up, but Jones brought up an interesting uh, Absolutely. Point, point there. That I just true. wanted to comment on that, that the proposed expansion of the Champagne region totality doesn't represent uh, great volume. It, 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 not, it doesn't mean that the world will be flooded and, uh, you know, with a lot more French French champagne. I think something like 2,000 hectares on top of the region that's 35 to 40,000 hectares already. So it's, uh, they, they've done this before. They, they've expanded the, the region for whatever reason. This time it's got a lot more attention than it has in but anyway, just uh, uh, what I want to uh, sparkling wine has different styles itself, right? So when you select Absolutely. when you select the brands, are you going to be, for instance, are you, are you interested in the difference between, say, a, a white sparkling wine and rosé so sparkling wine? Or particularly given them sales trends and uh, looking at the magic seven percent cutoff and doing those kinds of things, we can even look at various methods. Uh, we have total flexibility in our own country on the wines that we test here. Uh, the other eight countries, seven countries, got to get, there are nine universities, seven countries, right? So the uh, other institutions get to pick their local product, the ones that they want. So we can have as wide a range as we, as we would like. And we're looking for suggestions. Clearly, this is directions for further research. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I'm here, is we want to do research. It's going to be of some help to somebody. It's a great opportunity. We have all of these Gen Y consumers from all of these countries. Uh, let's make it really good research. Because that, that would, as a producer, that would be of interest to, uh, to me if, uh, say, the research found that color right, was a was a very important consider consideration that somehow it affected perception and it affected uh, preference because whether you choose to make it in a white style or in a, in a rosé style, it's not that big a difference. It's uh, it, you know, producing like a rosé sparkling wine is not uh, well, it'd be nice, but you know, there's these reasons why we can't. Right? If you can make the one, you can make the other. And for those of you that can't see, that's Paul Boss from Shadow of the Sharp is making this uh, comment. Uh, <laughs> I wave it again. This is the kind of thing that I would 
really like you uh, to give some thought to because we are now approaching the time when we're starting to uh, nail down the methodology, the protocol, the research protocol. So the more comments that we can get, the better piece of research and the more valuable it will it will be. So thank you. Yeah. Um, nice to see you. Question with respect to, to standardizing groups, because you're allowing uh, the countries to make different regions, but you're using a standard champagne and standard how, right. how far in correlating uh, sensorial results between groups? Like how far, um, I guess I'm asking if one country tends to perceive the same champagne as being more bitter or less. They're absolutely, uh, all of the co-authors, uh, colleagues from around the world are just fascinated with this. And uh, universally delighted that Gary is coming on to be part of the team on this. So it's something that is going to be uh, incorporated in it. all of the other places. Okay. Yeah, so you'll see this pop sensitivity I just wonder if across, cultures. Results across cultures. And we would love to get somebody in Spain. Excellent. Just wondering on, on your delivery mechanisms, Carmen. Um, I was intrigued by the cans of sophisticated champagne. And I was wondering, would, would you be able to uh, apply that anywhere in your study as well so that, you know, uh, you're giving them a sample, but if you poured it out of a, a can, would that influence them as well? Because I find that intriguing. That's what I like working with you. Always come up with great ideas for me to do work. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a great idea there. It really is, uh, particularly for the blind tasting, obviously. And uh, because all of the bump that you read about the sparkling in a can is that it tastes virtually identical to uh, wine out of a bottle. Uh, but there's an opportunity. Yeah, Linda. Well, I'm just going to sure. say two years ago. So my data at our uh, I was talking with Sherry McEdwards in preparation for a talk I was giving, and I asked her about uh, sparkling wine in Japan because it had just come in. I have talked about alternative things, and she said, "Does not sell in Ontario. Does not sell. We lost money. The LCBO. Uh, so I'm curious to learn how Sophia is doing in the market, and do we sell it in Canada? And I'm, I would doubt that she would bring it in." It's not on the LCBO list. Yeah. That is all I know. They may be elsewhere in Canada. Uh, I went down and I was talking uh, with Bob oh, Flank on her name. Ellen, quick. Uh, LCBO, uh, bottom of the hill. Nina, yeah. thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, we went on the computer and we we're looking for uh, Black Tower. We're looking for Sophia. And, it's well, not here on the computer. They found that it just didn't sell here. So I'm not surprised that they're not bringing it in. So that, I'm just indicating that could show a cultural difference between uh, Canada and the U.S. Yeah, the way that it was launched in the club scene yeah. in uh, those uh, areas. Did you, how many of you saw that thing with uh, uh, Sophia and the other guy? and knew what was in the, I mean, to me it just looked like a can of tab. Mm -hmm. Part of the Red Bull. <laughs> Red Bull, yeah. something, yeah. something uh, like that. So if you see somebody walking around in a club with a can that looks like a pop, uh, it's funny positioning to me, funny positioning in total, uh, where you've got the print advertising that's got pop, 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 pop. I, I'm not sure that that's exactly uh, the best message. I think we're, uh, we're just on time, Kevin. So thank you for a, a fun, fascinating presentation. Perfect. Are we done? There was a question from someone online. Online. Wow, the first. Yeah, I okay, that's right. Shout it out. How, as an Ontario winery, do we seek support from the Ontario government? <clears throat> Excuse me, and the LCBO for this Gen Y market to promote and sustain our Ontario wine industry. It's a great question. It's not something I research. Uh, I'll keep coming back to it and saying that I'm interested in consumer behavior. What makes people buy? What people makes people not buy? Uh, when we start getting into uh, politics, economics, uh, I'm treading on 
dangerous ground because that's not my expertise. Uh, if uh, the individual wants to talk to me uh, about hot buttons to get people to buy and other landmines to uh, avoid, absolutely love to talk to them. Okay, and thank you, by the way. Thank you, folks.